Insulin resistance is a key risk factor for devastating chronic diseases, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and cancer. That is bad news because the majority of the adult population is now insulin resistant. Even if you don't have obesity or type 2 diabetes, you may still be insulin resistant and not even know about it. And if you are indeed insulin resistant, reversing it may be one of the most important things you can do for your long-term health. To reverse it, you need to know what may be causing it. So in this video, we're going to discuss the main causes of insulin resistance. Welcome to Nourished by Science on YouTube. My name is Mario, and on this channel, I discuss evidence-based nutrition as it relates to the prevention of chronic diseases. I'm a little tired today, but I'm recording this anyway because I'm fired up for this topic. This here is maybe not the most sexy of topics, but I do think it's incredibly important to understand all of the major causes of insulin resistance. And that will set us up nicely for the coming months when we'll be discussing all of the different ways to reverse insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is a big, big problem, and it's extremely common. We can get a sense of the magnitude of the problem if we consider that insulin resistance is one of the key factors underlying type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, and that, for example, in the United States, about 50% of the adult population, about 133 million people, have either diabetes or prediabetes. And even if we only consider young adult Americans between 18 and 44 years who do not have manifest diabetes, 40% are still insulin resistant. I have not seen prevalence estimates for insulin resistance for the entire world, but one can easily appreciate how many people must be insulin resistant if we consider that 537 million adults have manifest diabetes and another 541 million have prediabetes worldwide. This is so concerning because insulin resistance is a risk factor for many other chronic diseases. We'll discuss this in the very next video in a lot more detail, but basically, Insulin-resistant individuals have an elevated risk not just of type 2 diabetes, but also heart disease, stroke, cancer, and many other chronic conditions, often without even knowing it because many people never had a lab test done to assess whether they may be insulin resistant. And what is it that causes insulin resistance? There are a lot of different triggers for insulin resistance, but I've tried to group them into a list of the 16 most common ones. In this video, I will touch briefly on each cause, but we will go into much more detail in future videos, in which we'll also discuss how to address these specific causes to reverse insulin resistance. The way I suggest the information in this video could be used is that if you are not insulin resistant yet, then this video will teach you what to watch out for and ideally avoid in the future to make sure you will remain insulin sensitive. But if you know or suspect that you are insulin resistant, then you can go through this video to try to figure out which of these triggers could be the cause or causes of your insulin resistance. If this video gives you some ideas, I suggest you discuss these further with your doctor. And by the way, if you're uncertain about what insulin does in the body and what insulin resistance is, I strongly suggest that you pause this video here and first watch this linked video up there about the basics of the regulation of blood sugar. And now the causes of insulin resistance. Number one, visceral and ectopic fat. There is a lot of evidence linking insulin resistance to the accumulation of visceral fat and ectopic fat. Visceral fat is also called intraabdominal fat and consists of several fat depots inside the abdominal cavity surrounding the inner organs. Ectopic fat is fat that is deposited inside muscles and inner organs that are not designed to store fat, such as the liver. Here in this image, we can see clearly that even though these two men, Mark and Jim, have an identical total body fat percentage, Jim has a lot of visceral fat, while Mark has very little. Ectopic fat cannot be seen here, but usually if someone has more visceral fat, they also tend to have more ectopic fat as well. So Jim, here in this example, would be expected to be much more insulin resistant than Mark. There are numerous factors that can contribute to fat accumulation in visceral and ectopic depots, but probably the most important one is that the main storage site for fat in the body, the subcutaneous fat tissue just under the skin, is at full capacity and can no longer store more fat. For more detail on the relationship between healthy fat storage in subcutaneous fat depots and the deposition of visceral and ectopic fat leading to insulin resistance, please take a look at the dedicated video I made about this topic. 
The conclusion here is that you want to minimize the amount of fat in visceral and ectopic depots. Second, chronic hyperinsulinemia. We also do have evidence that chronic hyperinsulinemia can cause insulin resistance. As I discussed in more detail in the last video, chronically elevated insulin concentrations, as we see in a clinical procedure called a hyperinsulinemic clamp, or in patients with a benign tumor of the pancreas called an insulinoma, do seem to cause insulin resistance. I also discussed that this does not seem to be the case for the typical up and down in blood insulin levels that results from consuming a diet rich in carbohydrates, because there is no consistent evidence that high carb diets lead to insulin resistance compared to low carb diets. However, several of you wondered whether constant snacking on refined carbs or drinking sugary drinks all day may keep insulin levels chronically elevated and whether this could lead to insulin resistance in these individuals. So an example could be someone who starts the day with a breakfast of toast and jam, then they're hungry again two hours later and have a muffin as a snack. For lunch, they have a sandwich with cheese and a regular can of soda, followed by a couple of chocolate chip cookies as an afternoon snack and rice with vegetables for dinner. And this type of highly glycemic diet with regular snacks in between the main meals would certainly be expected to keep blood insulin levels elevated above baseline all day. Now, whether this could cause insulin resistance, I don't know. I think it could, but we just don't have a good human intervention study that has tested this. What I will say though is that even if we had clinical trial data that this way of eating does not cause an increase in insulin resistance, I'd still say it's certainly not a good habit to consume refined grains and sugars regularly particularly sugars in liquid form. And it's also not a good idea to never give your body a break and consume calories constantly. In this context, let me explain one mechanism through which chronic hyperinsulinemia may induce insulin resistance. In a previous video, I explained that insulin binds to the insulin receptor, for example, in muscle cells. That stimulates a cascade inside the cell that has several effects. And these effects differ slightly depending on which cell the insulin is bound to. In a muscle cell, the insulin signal causes glucose transporters called GLUT4 to move to the cell membrane, and then glucose from the blood can enter the cell through these glucose transporters. Now, there are several mechanisms through which this cell could become insulin resistant. One is related to the fact that after insulin binds to the insulin receptor, they are bound tightly, you know, very firmly, and cannot just let go. So the cell takes the entire complex of insulin and the insulin receptor up inside the cell and either degrades it, which means it digests the proteins into their amino acid components, or recycles it, which means that the receptor is separated from the insulin in a specific part of the cell. This is important because it means that insulin binding to the insulin receptor temporarily reduces the number of free available insulin receptors on the cell surface. It takes a while until the number of insulin receptors on the cell surface is increased to a normal level again. And this would suggest that it's a good idea to give the cells time to recover after a highly glycemic and highly insulinemic meal. Hope this makes some sense. The conclusion here is that you want to avoid chronically elevated insulin concentrations. To be safe, it would make sense to minimize the consumption of foods with a high glycemic index and to give the body a few hours between meals to get back into a fasting state. The third potential cause of insulin resistance is inflammation. So inflammation in the body is known to directly induce insulin resistance in all cells exposed to the inflammation. Why may that be? Let's imagine you cut yourself while preparing dinner and some nasty bacteria from your knife are now entering your skin through that cut. So now you have bacteria attacking your skin cells and threatening to get into your bloodstream from which they could travel anywhere in your body. We need to prevent that from happening. Fortunately, your body has defensive forces, our white blood cells, part of our immune system, and these white blood cells move from the blood into the skin. And within moments, the bacteria and our immune cells are involved in a gruesome battle. We can see this from the outside. You know, within maybe a few hours, the skin is getting warm and red, and this activation of immune cells is what we call inflammation. The problem is that more and more bacteria are entering the wound and our immune cells are getting tired and hungry. They need more energy, and their preferred source of energy is sugar, glucose. So the fighting immune cells start taking up glucose from the blood. 
the problem is that there is sometimes fairly little glucose available in the blood and a lot of hungry mouths to feed. So evolution has done something very smart. The white blood cells make certain signaling molecules called cytokines to tell the other skin cells that there is inflammation going on. And one effect of these cytokines is that they make non-immune cells insulin resistant, which prevents them from taking up glucose. That makes a lot of sense, right? We are trying to defend the body and the fighting immune cells get their food first, right? Locally, here in the tissue, after you've cut yourself, it does make a lot of sense that inflammation causes insulin resistance in the tissue. The cells residing in that tissue can do with a little less glucose for a few hours, and making them insulin resistant ensures that the fighting immune cells have all the energy they need. And because this inflammation affects only this you know, local tissue, this means that only this small part of your body is insulin resistant, and the rest of the body is not affected. However, the same thing can also happen in the entire body. Imagine you have a whole body infection with the flu or a severe infection of a large organ, such as pneumonia. Then many more immune cells in your body are fight in fighting mode, and as a result, your entire body may become in, you know, at least somewhat insulin resistant. Or if you have an autoimmune disease where your own immune system is attacking your own body, that could also lead to insulin resistance. Or if you just had major surgery, you know, your inflammation markers are going up quite a lot usually after major surgery, and you will be very insulin resistant for a few days. Or what we discussed in a recent video, low-grade chronic inflammation in fat cells all over your body, which is a result of these fat cells being too large and overwhelmed. What all of these have in common is that the immune system is activated and that the resulting inflammation causes insulin resistance in all of the cells that are in contact with the inflammation. The good news is that once the inflammation subsides, insulin sensitivity will normalize again. Cause number four, low muscle mass. Now, this is an interesting one that many people don't know about. Even if you don't have excess body fat or excess visceral and ectopic fat mass, you know, you may still be insulin resistant if you have low muscle mass. In one study, participants were insulin sensitive if they had low body fat mass and high muscle mass, but they were insulin resistant if they had elevated body fat mass, which we would have expected based on what we discussed earlier, right? Because having a higher body fat mass makes it more likely that someone has crossed their own personal fat threshold and that they need to store some of their body fat in visceral and ectopic depots. However, in this study, even people with low body fat mass were insulin resistant if they had low muscle mass. This is consistent with another study in 132 adults, mostly young and overweight, in whom investigators measured insulin resistance and muscle mass, but also body fat mass and even visceral and ectopic fat mass. They found that those with the lowest muscle mass were the most insulin resistant, even after statistically adjusting for body fat, visceral fat, and ectopic fat. The conclusion here is that for optimal insulin sensitivity, you require both high muscle mass and low body fat mass, or to be more precise, low visceral and ectopic fat mass. The fifth potential cause of insulin resistance I'd like to talk about is physical inactivity. Maybe it's not a surprise to anyone that people who are very sedentary are more insulin resistant, because wouldn't they be expected to have less muscle mass and maybe even more fat mass? Fat mass? two factors we already discussed that cause insulin resistance. Yes, this is true, but interestingly, we can detect a major negative impact of physical inactivity on insulin sensitivity, even independent of lower muscle or higher fat mass. For example, if you take someone and put them on bed rest for even just three days, they develop pretty massive insulin resistance, even though their body weight and fat mass barely change during this time. In other words, even if you exercise, say, twice a week, if otherwise you sit at a desk or on the couch, you may become quite insulin resistant just because of these periods of inactivity in between the formal exercise sessions. So inactivity itself seems to trigger insulin resistance, and the low muscle mass that results from long-term inactivity causes additional insulin resistance on top of that. Cause number six, stress. Throughout evolution, stress has been a complex, coordinated response of our body to danger. So let's assume you are a Stone Age human and you just ate some meat and some berries. Your insulin levels are moderately elevated, 
And insulin is shuttling the sugar from the berries and the fat from the meat into your fat cells for long-term storage. Suddenly, you see a huge cave bear approaching your camp. And that triggers what we commonly call a fight or flight or acute stress response. Your body secretes a number of hormones, most notably cortisol and, ad and adrenaline, which is also called epinephrine. One of the things these two hormones do is make your tissues immediately insulin resistant. Why does that make sense? As we discussed in previous videos, after a meal, insulin coordinates the long-term storage of energy. However, in a fight or flight response, we need all the energy we can mobilize to be ready, readily available. And as a result, we want blood levels of glucose and also fatty acids to be elevated to enable us to fight or flee. So by making fat cells insulin resistant, the fat cells immediately stop taking up glucose from the blood and instead they now secrete fatty acids into the blood, as if you were in the fasting state. In the liver, insulin resistance initiates the release of glucose into the blood, again as if you were in the fasting state. In insulin-resistant muscle tissue, insulin is also less able to help glucose into the cells. As a result of all of these actions, blood levels of the two main body fuels, glucose and fatty acids, increase. That makes sense, right? The body wants to make sure we have all of the fuel we need. But how does it make sense that muscle cells also become insulin resistant? Wouldn't it be better to allow the muscles to continue to take up glucose so that we have the energy to fight or flee? Remember that if our muscles contract as an exercise, but also as we are fighting a cave bear or running away from it, our muscles can take up glucose from the blood in a manner that is independent of insulin. So all is good. The cortisol and epinephrine response triggers insulin resistance everywhere, raising our blood glucose and fatty acid levels. But our contracting muscles are able to take up sugar from the blood as needed, and we have all the energy we need to fight the bear and hopefully defeat it. Great. Except it isn't great these days. You are developing the same fight or flight response all day as you're sitting in your office again and again. Just from getting that upsetting email from your boss, maybe because you're nervous about that presentation you need to give, or because you have a deadline and know you won't make it. And now you're having so many moments of acute stress response that the stress and with it the elevated cortisol and adrenaline levels becomes chronic. And chronically being exposed to these hormones will keep you insulin resistant. There are two other noteworthy consequences of chronic stress. For one, there is evidence to suggest that chronic stress may trigger low-grade chronic inflammation. That may sound counterintuitive because usually corticosteroids are anti-inflammatory. There are data to support the idea that both acute and chronic stress are commonly associated with low-grade chronic inflammation. And as we discussed earlier, low-grade inflammation induces insulin resistance in its own right. The second aspect is that under the influence of chronic stress, we start to accumulate more fat in our visceral fat depots. Remember that acutely, stress causes fat cells to become insulin resistant and to release fatty acids. These fatty acids, if they're not being used otherwise, need to go somewhere, and they tend to partially accumulate in visceral fat. So note that this is one instance where someone could accumulate quite a lot of visceral fat even though they haven't crossed their personal fat threshold and where they could theoretically still store excess fat in their subcutaneous fat depots. The insulin resistance in fat cells induced by chronic stress is simply preventing the storage of fat in subcutaneous depots. Taken together, stress acutely makes the entire body insulin resistant and also triggers a low-grade inflammatory response, as well as, in the long run, an accumulation of fat in visceral depots, all of which are major contributors to insulin resistance. Potential cause of insulin resistance number seven, sleep deprivation. We do have quite compelling data that as little as a single night of insufficient sleep measurably reduces insulin sensitivity. For example, in one study, participants were allowed to sleep for only four hours one night and as much as they wanted, up to 8.5 hours another night. Insulin sensitivity was measured by the gold standard clamp the following morning each time and was reduced by a whopping 25% after sleep deprivation. 
In another study, sleep was limited to five hours a night for one week, and again, insulin sensitivity was reduced by 20% compared to normal sleep duration, where participants were allowed to sleep as long as they wanted. Sleep deprivation leads to an increase in cortisol levels in blood, and one study could demonstrate that artificially keeping cortisol levels low partially blocked the insulin resistance stimulating effect of sleep deprivation. This suggests that sleep deprivation at least partly causes insulin resistance through an increase in cortisol levels. Causal factor number eight, a dysfunctional gut microbiota. As you are probably aware, our body is host to a very large number of microorganisms in our gastrointestinal tract, particularly the colon. There has now been a lot of research showing clearly that the types of bacteria we have in our gut and their metabolites, you know, whatever they're doing, whatever they're secreting, this is strongly associated with insulin resistance. Now, as we always say, association doesn't necessarily equate to causation. So one experiment is particularly intriguing. Investigators started with a group of men who were insulin resistant and actively changed the composition of their gut microbiota by a procedure called a fecal transfer. Yeah, I agree. It does not sound like something I would volunteer for anytime soon. Anyways, this was actually a randomized controlled trial in that men were randomized to either receive a rectal infusion of their own gut bacteria or gut bacteria from very insulin sensitive lean men. And the very intriguing finding was that when these insulin resistant men received gut bacteria from insulin sensitive people, their insulin sensitivity as measured by the gold standard clamp increased by about 70%. So based on these data, I lean towards the idea that the gut microbiome is not just associated with insulin resistance, but that there is a cause-effect relationship there. Also of interest here is that the gut microbiome is also associated with our overall body fat mass, the amount of fat we store in visceral depots, and whether or not we are in a state of low-grade chronic inflammation. As we discussed earlier in the video, all of these also determine whether or not we are insulin resistant. This is a complex literature with hundreds of scientific publications in both animal models and humans, and we'll leave it for a future video to discuss in more detail to which degree cause and effect relationships may be underlying these observed associations. We'll also discuss in future videos to which degree we can modify our gut microbiome through our diet and lifestyle. There's a lot to say about this topic for sure. Factor number nine, a circadian rhythm that is out of sync. Well, to understand what is meant with that, let's start by talking about biological clocks. This is actually super fascinating. All of us have what is known as a master clock in our brain. Without going into too much detail, that master clock consists of a number of molecules, the concentrations of which oscillate up and down roughly in a 24-hour cycle. And that master clock receives inputs from our eyes about whether it's day or night, and that helps set that internal master clock. The master clock is relevant for basically all biological processes because it is connected to individual clocks in each cell of our body. Through this connection, the brain is able to affect what each tissue is doing at any given time. This is what we call a circadian rhythm with the word circadian referring to processes that are re recurring on a 24-hour cycle. Normally, we are awake and active during the day when we are exposed to natural light, and that is also the time when we usually eat. So if we expose ourselves to light at night or eat at night, this would disrupt our normal circadian rhythm, meaning our circadian rhythm is out of sync. Well, humans historically, before we had electricity, probably ate most or all of our calories during daylight. And it's therefore maybe not too astonishing that our body's ability to metabolize food is diminished overnight. So glucose tolerance, our ability to keep our blood sugar within the normal range, is lower already in the evening than in the morning. And then that drops further overnight. So why is this relevant? For one, people who eat late in the evening or even at night, such as shift workers, would be expected to have higher glucose levels in response to high-carb meals than if they ate the same meals during the day. We also have a lot of evidence from observational studies that people who regularly work the night shift tend to be more insulin-resistant than those who sleep at night. 
they also tend to weigh more, which makes these data difficult to interpret. Do these observations suggest that working the night shift directly triggers insulin resistance? Or does working the night shift regularly simply lead to excess calorie intake? And then the higher body weight and fat mass tend to make people more insulin resistant. We do have some evidence that suggests that acutely disrupting the normal circadian rhythm leads to insulin resistance in just a few days, even without any changes in body weight or composition. This was tested in laboratory studies. Participants came in twice to spend a few days in a windowless room in randomized order. During one stay in the room, the investigators recreated the normal day-night rhythm outside that the participants' internal clocks were used to. When the sun shone outside, they lit the room brightly and the participants were active and ate their meals. When it was night outside, they switched off the lights and the participants slept in line with their internal clock. During the second stay, the investigators over time slowly shifted the normal day-night rhythm such that after a few days, the room was dark when it was daylight outside and the participants slept. And when it was night outside, they lit the room brightly and the participants were awake, active, and ate their meals. Food intake and hours of sleep were matched between these conditions. But at the end of the lab simulated night shift condition, the participants were a lot more insulin resistant, without a difference between the conditions and body weight. The conclusion here is that being exposed to light and eating food and being active when our own circadian rhythms tells us it should be night results in insulin resistance. Cause number 10, puberty. There are two physiological states in which the body normally becomes insulin resistant, and puberty is one of these. The effect is fairly sizable, with around a 20 to 40% or so reduction in insulin sensitivity in both boys and girls who are going through puberty. This effect is reversible, so by the end of puberty, they return to their pre-puberty insulin sensitivity. Factor number 11 is the second physiological state characterized by insulin resistance, pregnancy. As a normal pregnancy progresses, the mother becomes more and more insulin resistant, usually becoming 40 to 60% less insulin sensitive by the third trimester when compared to before or right after the pregnancy. If the woman is able to compensate for this massive insulin resistance by producing more insulin, she will remain glucose tolerant. But quite frequently, pregnant women are not able to fully compensate, in which case they become glucose intolerant and potentially develop gestational diabetes. Because the insulin resistance is transient, the gestational diabetes may go into remission again once the baby is born. Cause number 12, certain medications. It is well known that several classes of medications cause insulin resistance. These include particularly antiretroviral drugs, which are your drugs to treat HIV infection, second-generation antipsychotics, and corticosteroids. This is not an exhaustive list, and the main point I'd like to make here is that if you take any medications for an extended period of time, I think you want to have a conversation with your doctor about whether the medication can lead to things like weight gain, insulin resistance, or other side effects. Obviously, do not stop taking your medication just because you are worried about insulin resistance, and instead, always make sure to discuss your concern with your physician. Cause number 13, certain medical conditions. There are quite a number of medical conditions that induce insulin resistance. From what we already discussed, it shouldn't be a surprise that this includes all acute infections and all chronic inflammatory conditions, including autoimmune diseases. As a rule of thumb, the more severe the inflammation and the higher the portion of your body that is affected by the inflammation, the more likely it will be that systemic insulin sensitivity is impaired. So if you had a little infection on your big toe, that big toe will be insulin resistant, but the rest of your body will not be affected much. However, if you have a major autoimmune disease that affects a large portion of your body or several tissues such as lupus, you may well become very insulin resistant. Next on the list are conditions that affect hormone levels in your body. Thyroid disease is a common one as both hyper and hypothyroid conditions have been linked to insulin resistance. Cushing's disease is another example. In Cushing's disease, the body makes too much cortisol chronically, and just like chronic stress-induced increases in cortisol levels cause insulin resistance, so does Cushing's disease.
Another common medical condition worth mentioning here is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is associated with insulin resistance, but the observational data cannot tell us with a high degree of confidence whether sleep apnea triggers insulin resistance or whether insulin resistance is present in sleep apnea suffer sufferers only or mostly because these patients also tend to be overweight or obese. It is therefore noteworthy that treatment of sleep apnea with CPAP, that is continuous positive airway pressure, improves insulin sensitivity, suggesting that a cause and effect relationship is underlying the observed association between sleep apnea and insulin resistance. And then I'd like to mention a condition that is associated with insulin resistance, but with a somewhat complex cause-effect relationship, polycystic ovary syndrome, or PCOS. It is complex because insulin resistance could well be a cause or consequence of PCOS. Many of you have requested a separate video about PCOS, and I may tackle this in much more detail soon. Factor number 14, menopause. When women go through menopause, their insulin sensitivity tends to decline for a number of potential reasons. For one, hormonal changes often lead to weight gain, and depending on their personal fat threshold, this by itself could lead to an increase in visceral and ectopic fat mass. On top of any weight gain, women also experience a shift in their body fat distribution, with an increase in their visceral fat mass even independent of any weight gain. As one would expect, such an increase in visceral fat mass is associated with an increase in insulin res resistance. And lastly, the hormonal changes occurring during menopause could also contribute to insulin resistance independent of the effect on body fat mass and distribution. Factor number 15, old age. Higher age is strongly associated with greater insulin resistance. This reduction in insulin sensitivity with older age is thought to be related to a number of changes in body composition that occur with age. For one, aging is associated with a reduction in muscle mass, and low muscle mass, as we discussed earlier, is associated with insulin resistance. This age-related loss of muscle mass is called sarcopenia. Aging also is associated with a shift in the body fat distribution, with a reduction in subcutaneous fat mass and an increase in visceral fat mass. So in other words, the personal fat threshold seems to decline with aging, and we may gain visceral fat even if we don't gain fat mass overall. Aside from these changes in body composition, also consider that sleep deprivation, certain medical conditions, and medication intake increase with age and may contribute as well to lower insulin sensitivity in older individuals. In women, as we just discussed, one such condition is menopause, which seems to accelerate the increase in visceral fat mass and insulin resistance that occurs normally with aging. The data that I have seen suggests that we should be able to maintain reasonably normal insulin sensitivity as we age if we avoid the loss of muscle mass, the gain of fat mass, and the comorbidities that often come with age. That is obviously easier said than done, but what I'm arguing is that maybe aging itself is not necessarily per se all that negative but that it's the weight gain and sedentary lifestyle that usually comes with it. And lastly, factor number 16, a poor diet. Now, this is a nutrition channel, and I would do you a disservice if I quickly rushed through all of the dietary factors that are linked to insulin resistance. I will therefore just tease here that over the next 20 or so videos, we will discuss a large variety of dietary factors, including calorie intake, alcohol, a variety of vitamins, minerals, and trace elements, advanced glycation end products, the role of carbohydrates, fat, and protein, uh, certainly also the effects of specific carbs or fats, such as fructose, long-chain saturated fatty acids, medium and short-chain fatty acids, probiotics and prebiotics, different spices and supplements. And, and for each of these, not just discuss how these are linked to insulin resistance, but also go into detail about how we can utilize each of these factors to improve our insulin sensitivity. I firmly believe that knowing about these factors and making, you know, in some cases small, but in other cases maybe more substantial changes to our diet can absolutely make a huge difference to our insulin sensitivity and many other health outcomes. Summary and conclusions. What I'm hoping you can now appreciate is that there is no single cause of insulin resistance. It is therefore important to be clear about which of these factors we personally are exposed to, because to normalize insulin sensitivity, we need to address the specific cause or causes. This is something that, in my opinion, is done too little in modern clinical medicine. Insulin resistance doesn't per se have any symptoms, 
and it's usually ignored in primary care. And only once we develop high blood sugar levels or diabetes, if we develop these, do we start to intervene, but only by treating you know, the high blood sugar, not always by trying to address the insulin resistance or its root causes. When you consider the different causal factors that can trigger insulin resistance, please be clear that for each, there is often a dose-response relationship, such that, say, a little bit of visceral fat and ectopic fat causes mild insulin resistance, while a very large amount of visceral fat, combined with severe fatty liver disease, leads to massive insulin resistance. Same if you're taking a corticosteroid medication. Taking a low dose for a few days will have very different effects than taking a high dose over a longer period of time. Also consider that the effects of these different triggers may be cumulative. For example, if a lean and highly active girl enters puberty, her insulin sensitivity will worsen, but it will worsen from very good to good. However, if a girl with abdominal obesity enters puberty, the insulin sensitivity may worsen from poor to very poor, and that girl may then be at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Lastly, let me be clear that some of the potential causes of insulin resistance mentioned in this video pose a bit of a chicken and egg problem. For example, low muscle mass does cause insulin resistance, but insulin resistance also makes it harder to gain muscle mass. Similarly, insulin resistance is thought to play a role in the development of PCOS, but PCOS is also thought to lower insulin sensitivity. This is actually something that is typical for this literature, because insulin plays such an important role in many biological processes in our body. Insulin resistance and the hyperinsulinemia that results from it also have many downstream effects, and it's therefore not always easy or even possible to clearly say what causes what in the first place. Okay, that's it for this video. I hope this was informative and can bring you on the path to preventing or reversing your insulin resistance. If the information was helpful, I'd appreciate it if you could leave a like and make sure you are subscribed to the channel so you don't miss any of my future content. As always, you can find all the references in the blog post associated with this video. The link is, as always, in the description box below the video. This was quite a lot, and I apologize that by necessity I had to cover all of these triggers of insulin resistance in a somewhat superficial fashion here. As we discuss different strategies for reversing insulin resistance in future videos, we will tackle each in more detail, including concrete changes we can make to our diet and lifestyle to ideally normalize our insulin sensitivity. Take care.